seconds. Four, three, two, one. Blog Talk Radio. Well, we made it to Friday. Tinfoil Hat Club, 04-14-2017, Scott Hensler. Special guest tonight, Mark Sargent. He joins us again. He's been with us before on the Flat Earth. This time, though, that we're going to talk about the Hollow Earth and the connection between the two. And I've addressed this in the past, but this time we're going to take a closer look. He's got some really in-depth information and some new updates uh, that, uh, that he has for us. And uh, I want to go over a couple things before I bring him on here. Next week, I'm going to be revisiting Jezebel borderline personality disorders and their destruction. I have a reason for my madness, and I'll reveal that a little later. But in either case, you know, as I mentioned before, we need to understand who was with us and who was against us. All right. Now, that's also going to partially connect with last Wednesday's show. So if you haven't heard that, Bring yourself up to speed and reminding everyone in May 12th, 13th, and 14th here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Hayden, that I'm going to have the Tinfoil Hat Club conference. And you can come go to the tinfoilhatclub.com conference page and see the information, uh, the, the presentation that we're going to give, but also flight uh, information and a link for hotels if you're coming from out of town. If you're going to come from out of town, please uh, RSVP, and uh, you can use that too through the email link that I've got there. All right, so hollow earth, solid earth, you know, what's really going on here? As I mentioned, I've, I've had uh, Mark come on tonight to bring us up to speed on this. Now, um, Admiral Byrd, even Charles Lindbergh, holes in the north and holes in the south poles, um, just absolutely incredible all the information that's been kept from us and so I hope to uh, bring more of that tonight with Mark. All right so I've got you on muted uh, Mark Sargent welcome and uh, go ahead and just take the floor. Oh and thank you for having me Scott it's a pleasure to be here and yeah when it comes to the the hollow earth and the flat earth is there a connection people have asked me that since really week one and yeah there is as a matter of fact i'll we'll, we'll do kind of a recap from from last time which is that's how i got into flat earth was i was looking at hollow earth in fact i i was so into hollow earth at one point I remember vividly taking a road trip out to Mount Shasta in California in the United States to kind of look for, you know, poke around and, and look for some old, uh, you know, seldom talked about hollow earth entrances. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. I really liked, I, I loved conspiracies like that. And of course, all, all the caves and all the access points had been dynamited or welded shut and, and uh, everything was, was pretty, pretty locked down. But it was still it was still kind of fun to think about, and that's when I really was, you know, the, the, all the Admiral Bird stuff was imprinted in my head. And for those of you who are kind of new to this, it's like, what are we talking about here? The the late Admiral Richard E. Bird, who took a rickety plane from in about what 1926 up until the up into the North Pole, and supposedly wrote in a diary that. He, he turned into like a journey to the center of the earth type thing where there was actual physical entrance at the North Pole and he went inside it and, and saw this, you know, the land that time forgot type scenario, which was cool. I, I, I totally bought into it and I thought it was a really cool thing and I still do. I still think it's really, really cool. But what was interesting was when I looked into it, 
that he didn't stay up there. So, you know, planes were terrible in 1926, where our planes, air aviation was in its infancy in 1926. But from 1928 all the way up until his death in 1957, he spent the rest of his life looking for something via aircraft in the South Pole, otherwise known in the flat earth community as the outer rim or the outer marker or the outer edge, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And he was looking out, it was 1928 until 1957, you know, better part of 30 years looking for something out there. And when you go online, you can you can watch a wonderful interview that he did in 1954 on the CBS television show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope. And it's spelled L-O-N-G-I-N-E-S, and I believe it's a watch company. And it's 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 a wonderful print. It was it was taken straight from a CBS affiliate, and the resolution is decent considering it's 1954. And he goes on to say, you know, several little key points. One was that there was a huge expanse of land bigger than the United States past the South Pole, which he hadn't even seen yet, which meant that nobody's seen it because he was the, the leading explorer in the world at that point, and he flew his own planes. And that the entire Antarctic continent was made out of resource rich materials and that nations could be squabbling over this thing for years and years to come and the people would be there forever. And again, that's what kind of led me into the whole flat earth thing, because you can ignore a lot of stuff, but you can't ignore conspiracies that are bigger than money. And by that, I mean, even though Admiral Byrd went on television and he said that the, everything there that the world could ever want. There was an entire mountain range made out of coal. There was uranium. There was oil. There was minerals. And there's nothing you could, you'd could you have to worry about. It's not like we were going to be chopping down any forest. There was no indigenous plant life, no animal life, except for the penguins on the beach. But those don't really count. And no indigenous populations. There was just millions and millions of square miles of ice and snow, deep snow and ice, except for the mountain peaks. And yet despite all this you know it's like oh perfect you know just fire everybody up get everybody down there start carving the place up despite all that the motivation to be there and he went on national television and was basically telling the companies they should go there they put the antarctic treaty into place in 1959 and it says in so many words that if you are a corporation not an individual but a corporation you cannot set up shop there ever and that means any country and no matter how much money, you know, big players, you know, China, Russia, they, the United States, no one's going, going around this. No one's trying to cheat. No one's trying to swindle. No one's trying to cut a backroom deal. It, how is that even possible? It's not. Plus, why would every nation unilaterally sign this treaty? Well, China needs the resources. Russia needed them after World War II. They were rebuilding. So, so were the UK. And, and the UK and Russia and Argentina and New Zealand and um, – Australia and the United States, and they, they, Chile, they were all down there. And yet they all abandoned it because of something that Admiral Byrd found. And you guys haven't figured out what, it, what I mean by now. I mean that way thousands of miles in from the beach was some sort of barrier, some sort of outer rim. Either that or he found another world on the other side. I don't believe it, though. I think we're in an enclosed system, hence the website enclosedworld.com. Mm -hmm. And that once they found out, it's like, holy smokes, you know, look, we can go into it, you know, but look at all the events that started happening after 1956. A lot of strange, strange things started happening in this world. And it, it changed us forever. It changed how the government treated us as a civilization. Anyway, but so, the, yeah, the hollow earth absolutely it d does dovetail into this. The, the reason is, it, you know, because people say, well, you know, you believed in hollow earth, but now you believe in flat earth. Can they is exist simultaneously? Yes, they can. Because we don't appreciate how thin of a band of altitude that we, we exist in. And by that, I mean 95% of our population lives between sea level and 5,000 feet, you know, give, you know, a mile, give or take. And that's true. You know, at about 7,000 feet up, we start getting altitude sickness for a certain percentage of the population. And once you hit like 10,000, 12,000, you know, it gets really hard to breathe. So you wouldn't need much of a, of a cavern system to supply an entire civilization, which kind of circles back around to what, uh, what I've been kind of talking about, which is if an entire civilization can live, you know, think about our airplanes, for example, our commercial air traffic 
cap out at about 10 miles. Spy planes, if you believe the declassified stuff, cap out at about 20 miles. So if you had a ceiling on, on a cavern that was only 100 miles high, that's all you'd need. And you could you could keep an entire civilization in there, which kind of, again, goes back into what are we in right now? People say, well, you know, what's the dome made out of? What's the ceiling made out of? Is it a heavy element? Is it a heavy water? Is it a frequency? Is it a, uh, is it a solid structure? You know, is it a firmament, like described in biblical texts? We, again, we could be in a hollow earth scenario, although it is so vast, I don't even know if you could call it a hollow earth because we're, we're more or less a snow globe. At that point, you just call it, you know, a snow globe underground. But, you know, that's speculation mostly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my rant, my opening rant. Well, I know that uh, the Germans or Hitler, Nazi, they certainly took uh, interest in that. And yes. my understanding from the Lindbergh uh, flight logs and and his diary that he ran into that. What do you know about that? Well, <clears throat> the Lindbergh story was an interesting one. Uh, there's two really good stories when it comes to conspiracies that again the general population just has no clue about. One was how the 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 Russians kept World War One from happening in the 1860s. And the second one is how Charles Lindbergh, because pilots are notoriously competitive, like you know, they treat it like any other organized sport, that Charles Lindbergh also discovered the hollow earth. Mm -hmm. And was very, that's a very interesting story because if you believe, you know, if you believe the Admiral Byrd diary, then you got to you got to give a little credibility to the Charles Lindbergh thing, which was that he went up there once he heard that that Richard Byrd had done it because Charles Lindbergh was equally a skilled pilot, if not better. And he took his wife up there. He and he and his wife took a flight to the same sort of region and also saw the same sort of scenario, but they took pictures while they were there. And the story goes that they actually came back to the States and kind of like, you know, explorers like to, to show off a little bit. That's the whole point of being an explorer. You don't want to anonymously discover something. You want to you want to talk about it. That's why uh, Richard Byrd was so great with press conferences, which is why he probably was off a little early in his life, in his early 60s, after you know, after he discovered it, because they probably went to him. They said, you know, are you going to keep the secret? And if you disagree, and if he was vocal enough, they said, look, he's going to do a press conference. He's going to blow the whole thing. So with Charles Lindbergh, he comes back with pictures, talks to the same sort of guys, and they say – yeah, you're not showing those pictures to anyone. This is not going to be a story in National Geographic. You are going to shut up about this and go in your way. And when he seemed like he was going to, and it sounds like it's straight out of a movie, but, you know, art imitates life and life imitates life, where he was going to talk. And so that's when the entire scenario of people are wondering, where have I heard this Charles Lindbergh, the Lindbergh baby story, mm -hmm. which is that he, they got a hold of him and they said, you know, basically showed him this is what just a taste of what we can do, not to mention we can destroy your legacy forever. And when they when they did that, surprisingly enough, he, he even went a step further. He kind of upped the game, which was he left the United States, renounced his citizenship and moved overseas and never came back. Yes. And why not? You know, his if he felt that his government tr treated him unfairly and, you know, but at the same time, he wasn't dumb enough to run, you know, to talk to people over in Europe, which he could have done. He could have you could have talked to, you know, journalists in Paris and London and, and those places, but he didn't. You know, maybe at that point he's thinking, well, you know, at least I've got my wife. But he was gonna get as far away from the United States as possible. Not to say, you know, I'm not I'm not bashing the United States specifically. Not to say that other governments don't do, you know, things for the greater good, but I I get I understand why they did it. It's uh it's one of those I don't I won't call it a necessary evil, but I you know, if he's one guy, and if he wasn't going to play ball, you know, they had to they had to determine what to do, and so that's what they did. What do you think, uh, Lindbergh? Uh, the pictures that they took. What do you think he captured? Oh, at the very least, he probably captured the entrance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he went inside. You know, I, I I don't. I'd hate to think that he actually caught pictures of mammoths and tropical jungles and that. But at the very least, if it was if there was geography that wasn't on any map. 
that would be, I mean, National, you know, back then, National Geographic would have run with that thing and, and all any other of the periodicals because that's what you live for. Back then, the, the media was so concentrated into just two forms. I mean, radio was barely, was radio even, what was radio even doing in the 1920s? Not much. And so you have most, mostly newspapers and magazines. And people would have hung on every word, every written word. And it would have been it would have been striking to see, but again, if a secret is big enough, it can be kept, especially in in a situation like that where most people have never even flown over the North Pole, or you know, a commercial airliner where you come even close to it, as opposed to seeing it for themselves. It's I believe it's part of this system, whereas the North Pole and especially the 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 southern outer rim is so geographically foreboding. For lack of a better word, um, it's it, the 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 negative reinforcement is so gradual, but so severe by the time you get out there that it scales up. That you, nobody wants to go there. I mean, when's the last time you even talked to a person? So I mean, it might be on somebody's bucket list. Oh yeah, I want to I want to go to Antarctica and have my picture taken with penguins. But even when they go, that's all they do. They literally stay on the coastline. They maybe t maybe go on the beach for a second. Say, oh yeah, I'm in Antarctica. You're not in Antarctica. And then you, know, you can get pictures. Royalty and celebs sometimes will do the South Pole thing, but they just go to where they say the South Pole is. Right. You know, they're not allowed to roam freely. I've seen some video that that apparently was from a Soviet space station, where there was a large opening and something like an aurora borealis or some type of electromagnetic field was yep. coming out of this thing. Is that something you've come across? Uh, no, and mostly, and I, I know that picture you're, that you're talking about here. It's a cool picture. I, I love it. It's just a photoshopped um, image, though, because <clears throat> from our standpoint, there is no space, you know, with a curved uh, Earth to, to speak of. And, and I know that's kind of a shock to some people, but you've got to remember the motivation you think you think protecting what we'll do to protect some things like national security and and uh, government and corporate interests for something like this it's so big that you're going to fake a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and and i mean again for people that, that are, are kind of new to this i'm not saying that that nasa is just fake i'm saying the only reason nasa was even created in the first place was to fake it because they had to so with Admiral Byrd first discovering this hole, did this lead him to think that maybe there was one at the other end and this is why he went to Antarctica? I don't think he had a choice. I think he was ordered. He, he, look, he was a military guy. He was an admiral. He follows orders like anybody else. Now, when you get up to be an admiral, he, you know, then you're, you're following what uh, uh, chief of staff type people, you know, the people that report directly to the White House, or or higher bodies than that. I believe that older civilizations, and I take your pick here, the Illuminati, the Rosicrucians, the, the Bilderbergs, the Rothschilds, CFR, the Trilaterals, it doesn't really matter. Some of those groups actually knew what the world looked like. You know, they may have had the old, the ancient maps, mm -hmm. copies of them. But until you have a technology that's, that's uh, beneficial to exploring, what do you really know? So, and I've, I've said this on several other things where it's like, look, you're the king of France in 1500. You've got a map that shows what the world really looks like, which is the UN flag, basically. And you're, you're looking at it and what, what can you do? You know, you, you don't have the tech. You've got wooden ships and you've got horses. That, that's not going to do you much good when it comes to Antarctica. So once the internal combustion engine came out in the early 1900s in the night in the United States and once they applied it to airplanes and that was almost immediately afterwards you know within 10 15 years then that's when you could do it then you could take you know uh, oil powered ships metal ships because then your metallurgy becomes much better the oil powered ships out there and then you could launch aircraft or seaplanes you know once your seaplane technology you know planes with with skids and you can land on the ice you can get, get all sorts of creative but the point was <clears throat> is that if you were exploring, again, all the moves that were made uh, really from the 1920s up until now have been pretty much what you'd expect from an operation like this, a, a multinational operation, which is first thing first, you would want to, once you figured out that the North Pole isn't what you thought it was, you, you've got to go out and look for the outer marker. But the outer marker is so much bigger 
than the North Pole. I mean, North Pole is just the center of the map. You just go there. Right. The outer marker, you don't know how far you have to go before you can actually judge the size of this thing because you still have to reach an edge before you can gauge the the, 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 the distances. And so, yeah, I think they, they ordered him to the South Pole because, look, he's the greatest living explorer, and you had him during the peak of his exploring years for 30 years, 1928 all the way up to 1954, well, 55, 56, better part of that just just flying around in the snow that's all he was doing and so yeah they were they were they wanted him to find it whatever it was so if you've got the maps let's say you're let's say you're part of the illuminati i i usually try to lump everybody into one big soupy group which i call the authority so let's say the authority orders him out there it's like all right don't come back till you find this and so he's going, he's doing, you know, tours and tours, and he comes back and does a book tour. And he goes, goes a couple more years, goes back, does a book tour. Nothing's happening. So by 1954, I think they, they had given up, which is so interesting because if you, if you did give up, that's what they would do, and that's Murphy's Law. So he comes out, it's like, well, yeah, there's nothing down there except money, <laughs> money to be made. So let's go make some. And then, you know, his very next mission, which was Operation Deep Freeze in 1955, that's when he found it. And yeah. then they had to had they everybody had to backpedal. Well, I I noticed that uh, the the prior explorers way back to the 1800s and so forth never really found an edge. They were going for years and years uh, and never found that edge. That uh, that no yeah. no. And I've got I've got to clear this up because a lot of people will mistake you know things we've thought about you know because the the ancient belief of the whole flat Earth thing is like all oh, the water is going to fall off the edge. I'm going, no, because the Antarctic coastline is so huge. One, it's very, very tall. It's not Game of Thrones tall, but it's very, very tall. It's, you know, 150, 200 feet straight up of ice. And then what's interesting is the continent, which is unlike any other continent that's out there, it's this giant plateau. Uh, most people don't even know. It's like most of this huge expanse of ice, regardless whether you think it's a continent or uh, a giant ring around us, is at about 7,000 feet. It's huge. That, that's minimum distance. And then it goes up higher and higher. It's just this giant flat area which with nothing on it. And if you're down there trying to explore, I mean, you couldn't ask for, again, if, if, if the system was made deliberately, and, and it was in, in my opinion, then you, wouldn't, you couldn't ask for better negative reinforcement. Let's say you're taking a ship down there, right? Even an early metal ship back in the day, right? Uh, you're getting within, I don't know, 200 miles of the shore, maybe, and you already see icebergs. If that doesn't turn you around, once you get to the shoreline, you get a you get sheer wall of ice, you know, just to get on dry land. And it's not even dry land when you get up there. It's still ice. And then once you get up there, with whatever supplies you brought with you, that's what you have to survive on because it's it's there's nothing there's nothing to cut down there's no nothing no game to shoot unless you're eating penguins and that's only going to buy you so much time and then once you decide to head inland you don't know how long it's going to be before you i mean it's just a horrible if the place just screams go away so the government didn't have to do too much to all they had to do was kind of do some subtle nudging here and there and all of our civilization never decided to go well, obviously, uh, Hitler had an idea, and along with his uh, submarines, were already down there. And I, from what I'm seeing from Admiral Byrd's diary or his flight log, that right. that was something that he'd run into. Now, that was that was during the only break that Admiral had, the Admiral Byrd had during his tours, his Antarctic tours, which was he was the during World War II. Everybody that was down on the ice left the ice to go do the World War II thing, right? Except for one country, and that was Nazi Germany. And that turns into a straight-up Raiders of the Lost Ark type scenario, which is great. I mean, that's that's some great storytelling right there. I'm wondering if Spielberg might have grabbed some of it. Which is, they were the only ones down there. Why was Germany down there during World War II? It was because they were looking... The, the stories weren't, weren't wrong. They were looking for anything metaphysical anything ethereal that's out there that could help them win the war why not if you could find a secret weapon like the ark of the covenant or the holy grail or whatever it is you're going to use it and so after world war ii was over 
And Admiral Byrd was literally there t- at the end. He was at the signing ceremony at the in the Japanese harbor. I think, uh, was MacArthur there? I can't remember. He might have been there too. And he was there for the signing. And right afterwards, they launched a massive military operation called Operation High Jump. Now, it wasn't like, a, you know, the, um, the Normandy operation or anything like that. It was a, but it was a full-blown carrier group. He took a full-blown military operation down to Antarctica. And to this day, they will never say what it was really for. They were saying, oh, for scientific research, it's like, really? It's a full-blown battle, battle group with support ships the whole nine yards and you went down there with a carrier group and he was the guy that led them and the, the stories that are coming out of that are, are they're just they're so wide they they cover such a wide band of possibilities but the one that I liked there's, there's two things that happened here one whatever happened was over and pretty much forgotten by the time, and this was in 1946, you know, so World War II ended in 1945. 1946 was when Operation High Jump was, was happening down there. And when he gets down there, whatever he did accomplished its goal in one form or another, whether or not, you know, whatever opponent he had faced down there. If they were trying to root out the Nazi bases, that's one thing. But it was obviously over and done with, because by the time 1954 rolled around, which is only eight years later, is, there were lots of countries down there and, and everything seemed to be business as usual. So whatever the Nazi problem was in 1954 was gone. And it was long gone. There wasn't even an issue. So what happened to the, Nazi, the remaining Nazi forces if they were down there? Now, the story that I like was that and I, I can't remember where I, where I read it, but it was an interesting little um, story, was that there was some sort of uh, ancient civilization down there. I'm not saying they're from another planet. I'm just saying that, that anything you think is a UFO is probably just older versions of us, older civilizations. You, you can, if you want to call them interdimensional, that's one thing. But they're not from Mars or Venus or anything like that. They're just from here. You know, no different than what, you know, what would happen if we all of a sudden – you know, flew fighter planes over an aborigine population that had never seen that before, or we we go on and on. Like that, one what was that wonderful uh, island tribe that was we used them as a staging base for supplies for World War II, and we bought up brought them all this cool stuff. You know, way their technology was way beyond anything they ever seen, and they were so sad that they wanted us to come back that they made Gilligan's Island versions of planes. As hmm. as altars to hope, hoping that we would come back with these little planes, <laughs> I thought was fantastic. Anyway, where was I going with this? What was it? What was the initial question? <laughs> <laughs> heading heading in towards the ice or or the finding out about the Nazi bases. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah the right. Nazi bases. So mm-hmm. the the story that I like. Sorry, I go off into the weeds sometimes, and, and I completely lose track. And and this is one of my gifts. So or curses. So. When they went out there, if you believe the story was that an ancient civilization was out there on the ice and Germany knew it and they didn't have the military forces to stop this carrier fleet. And so they asked this other, you know, the old civilization for asylum and the older civilization said, OK, you can, Yeah, you can come with us. But if you come with us you can't come back. It's kind of like a junior high dance type of thing. Once you leave, you're not getting back in. And that's, and that was it. They, they, they left, but the rule was what the rule was. And the, and I believe this, I believe in protocols and that's, and that sort of makes sense to me, which is, yeah, you can, you want to, you want to join the basement club and hang out with these other civilizations. Fine. You can do it, but you're not going back to yours. That's it. Because that, you know, there's certain protocols that, that cannot be broken. Sort of like, the same argument that people will throw out there well they'll say well you know people that, that that try to dismiss ufos and i say regardless where the ufos come from you do understand in fact star trek talked did did a little thing on this in uh, not the last movie but the the one that was two the one before this one which was you don't let the indigenous population see you in in all what you're doing because if they do you can alter their history uh, especially if they're um a religious based culture and that's why I, what never happens here they say why why isn't a ufo landed on the white house lawn it's like no 
it, you can't. You can't just come down and shake hands, take pictures, sign a few autographs, and leave. It's, it's you change everything. It's, even now, you would change something. I mean, forget about landing in the 1950s. I mean, what? Let's say you did it back in the 1800s. If you did it in the 1800s, people they had no idea what to do. If you were in the 1700s, you might think you were demons. And in fact, hundreds of years before that, you might think you were demons. And if anyone thinks that all this is kind of wild out there, uh, I challenge you. You want to look at something, uh, look at the greatest UFO event of all time, and you're thinking, oh, it's Roswell. No, it is not Roswell. It is the 1561 Nuremberg event. You can find it on Wiki. It is probably the finest, most elaborate UFO uh, spaceship gathering of all time and done for a solid hour over Germany. It, you know, Nuremberg, a big city back in the 1500s. And uh, they were there long enough that all the sketch artists came out and drew the whole thing. And, and and you're thinking, okay, what's the point? The point is, is that protocols have to be in place. O older civilizations cannot interact directly and change the history or change the future of the civilization that's that's currently on the living on the surface. And which is why the 1561 Nuremberg event, none of those ships touched down. Nobody got out, talked to anybody. They just left. And I think the whole the, you know, I, if you want me to go into it, I can. But that's. What, why the, the last group of ships that came in chased the others off. They were like the UN building or the UN um, troops. They, they, you, you, there's rules. Mm -hmm. And one of it is the every civilization has to develop naturally. Uh, kind of like our prime directive that we put in Star Trek. You, you don't want to, I mean, it's so easy to influence uh, budding civilizations that you don't, you know, if you want them to be authentic, you, you can't mess with them. I mean, yeah, you could pick off a few people in some mountains or the water or woods or whatever, but uh, you can't land in Main Street any, anywhere and just start messing up things. Anyway. Well, when the military Sorry. went down there, they did run into opposition. Oh, you... I'm sorry, say it one more time, you cut out? When the military went down there, they did run into opposition? I, I had heard that story as well, mm -hmm. and depending on how far you want to go with it, yeah, I mean, you know, I'd heard the stories about how the you know the the carrier group ran into advanced fighter technology and that they lost a few people and and uh, uh, that they were beaten back, that they were driven back. Is it possible? Sure it is. Sure it is. Uh, but could it also be? Let's put it this way: if it wasn't decisive, though, if there wasn't, let's say, let's say they went down there and then they did engage in I wouldn't say just the Nazis but this advanced technology and it could have been a minor skirmish but whatever it was they didn't send any future operations down there now they may have been said they have been told you know what go home you don't have to worry about the Germans anymore they're gonna be we will take care of them and they will never be a part of your world again and at that point sorry right so it's kind of a push it's not necessarily a win I mean, you didn't get to, to say that you crushed the Nazi fleet, at least not publicly. In fact, it's a story that you're going to squash as much as you can. Because even, even if you, you know, you don't, in fact, you sign gag orders as much as you can. You limit the amount of troop involvement and, and you know, make sure that nobody spills the beans when they get home. Of course, it sounds like a few people did, you know, because people are going to talk, kind of like Roswell. But uh, at whatever, again, whatever it was, I don't, it doesn't bother me too much because again by 1954 the the lead guy the guy that you know led the charge down there he didn't seem to care you know you watched his face he didn't even talk about it it was like antarctica was just another day for him well i know in his flight logs he did eventually run into types of flying saucers and everything why don't we go in that direction so we can start heading down in the hole sure the uh, Admiral Byrd, of course, uh, it, depending on what you look at, do I believe that all of his diaries are authentic eh, or flight logs? Eh, maybe, maybe. But it, it, since he flew, I mean, yeah, of course, the man, he flew enough planes and he flew planes back when, you know, with, there were things known as the Foo Fighters and the Foo Fighters, of course, you know, not just a band that is based off the those little weird colored dots that would fly around planes during World War II. They seemed like probes or cameras or whatever you want to call them. But it was interesting that both sides thought they were the other. You know, so the Germans thought it was us and the British, you know, and, and we thought it was the Germans. You know, well, why wouldn't we think it was the Germans? The Germans had such an advanced technology. So 
you know, Admiral Byrd, of course, of course he saw a lot of stuff, but he couldn't talk about it that much because he was still considered, remember, spaceship, the whole UFO sci-fi world didn't even really come into existence till the later part of his life. The, the, the early movies, like the, the Day the Earth Stood Still and When Worlds Collide, they didn't come along till, till later, you know, until the 50s. So whatever he saw, you know, he, you didn't really talk about that much because people didn't, it wasn't that people would label you crazy because people didn't know how to react. UFOs weren't even a real thing. You got to remember the, the first coined term for flying saucer was uh, Kenneth Arnold which was in up here up here in the northwest next mm-hmm. to Mount Rainier of all things right where he was flying above them and you know a training operation where there was uh, I say training because I've seen the same groups using night vision uh, in Colorado which is the, that uh, the you know small ships small craft you know not not very big about the size of cars maybe a little bigger and they're all linked together by some sort of electromagnetic tether And they, you know, for safety reasons, you know, nobody bumps into each other. And it seems like, honestly, every time I watch them, it seemed like driver's ed. It's like, oh, I get it. You're teaching them to fly. It's very cute. And, but he saw them from above. He was flying, they were, they were, they were um, flying above the tree line in the Northwest near Mount Rainier. And he said, that's where he came up with the whole, they look like upside down uh, tea saucers. They had that sort of dimension. So. Are you still there? Yes. So when when Admiral Byrd, um, you know, from his logs and everything, it says how he then was surrounded and they took him to a certain point or he saw an opening in the ice and all that. What do you yeah. think went on? <sighs> Whatever that was was either suppressed or discredited as much as possible. I mean, the only thing that I know about the, the diary stuff was, the, again, it, it's tough to it's tough for me to look at it all as you don't know which parts to pick out and, and believe I mean you can you know everyone's got their favorites of course but if there was if he was taken inside the core you know or inside off some sort of hollow earth theory again it wouldn't have to be very big not not at all even even a 10 mile high uh, opening wouldn't would be nothing you know it, it'd, be, it'd be more than big enough for a plane planes can operate in in much smaller distances than that but if he was taken in there and it was and if it was of high importance they would have kept him there he they would have made up reasons and he would have kept going to the north pole but instead again he just kept doing south south pole south pole south pole because again it made it made sense at that point you think about it if you're the authority you want to confirm what is going on you want to confirm the old maps and the first thing you need to do again is to create the boundary, and they did that brilliantly because they, not you know, once you have the center point, okay, fine, let's make find the first outer edge. That took a long, long time, even with refueling, which meant the outer edge is thousands of miles from the uh, the coastline of Antarctica. It's not like the Antarctica. The edge is not what everyone everyone thinks. It's this hard edge. Oh, the Antarctica. That's it. That's the edge of the world. No, it's probably thousands of miles inward. Enough that. If you have decent prop planes back in the 1950s, you still weren't finding it. And you, of course, you're going to search in a grid pattern. You're not, but eventually, you're you're going to figure it out. But you know, do do I believe that everything they they said about the North Pole was true? Eh, maybe, or was it a decent distraction enough that it kept people from looking at the real target? Because that's how I got into flat Earth. Was I looked at the only reason I I got into flat Earth was that. When I was looking at Antarctica, Richard Byrd's name came up. In fact, if his name hadn't come up as many times down in Antarctica, I probably wouldn't have paid that much attention to it. And then, you know, I started putting the the things together. You know, all the all the weird things, the high altitude the nuclear weapons testing, and you know, by the United States, the Soviet Union, and then the Antarctic Treaty, and then NASA being formed, and it just keeps going on and on from there. Well, I understand too that. Uh, 2002, a California TV crew disappeared who went down there to film the documentation of, of you know, some type of uh, terrain underneath the ice. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I'd heard about it. Again, you know, the, if they were down there and they went to the wrong place, they are going to be taken care of. This is the big reason that any... 
and you, you cannot underestimate the what the powers that be will do to keep certain secrets. This thing is so important uh, that you don't even want to let corporations go to you don't you will rather sacrifice billions of dollars in generated revenue to keep people out of there for you know, because they because they say well why would the Antarctic Treaty be so important because if you're an oil corporation that has billions at its at, at you know at revenue that you can get you know in in multiple different forms then what happens if you have a plane because remember you can get lost down there pretty easily you have one of your survey planes goes off course. Are you going to track this plane? Are you going to tail it? How many are you going to be able to tail it without them knowing that you're tailing it? What if they start going into a, a zone where you don't want them to be, where there's things happening that you don't want them to see? What what happens then? Uh, and then uh, on top of that, if you are this corporation and you're start encroaching on things, you know, it's like, well, we want to survey this area and this survey this area. You get to the point where the government says, yeah, you can't go past this point. And you, you're the corporation. You go, why? Why not? It's like, well, national security. It's like, what are you talking about national security? Nobody owns Antarctica. There's just too many weird, awkward discussions and situations where as a government or the authority or the powers that be, you don't want to be involved in. So you just – you it's it's all, all or nothing. So at that point, you, you just tell them, it's like, you know what? It's just going to be easier if we just shut this whole thing down and not let anybody come in here. And uh, it's it's worked. It's worked really well. What surprised me, though, is how well they've controlled the media side of things. Meaning if I'm the head of, let's say, Exxon Mobil, right? And I've got a lot of money. You know, I can frack in your backyard right now if I wanted to. I'm not, not only am I not allowed to go down to Antarctica, I'm not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that, that raised eyebrows for me. Which was look, I'm the head of Exxon Mobil. I know the editor at the New York Times and the Boston Globe and the Washington Post and so on and so on. Why can't I go into these one of these newspapers and say for for years and years, and run a full page ad? Full page ads would have been fairly cheap back in the day, and say, uh, yeah, uh, it'd be really great for my company to go down to Antarctica. And they're not even allowed to do that. They, and you know, lobbyists down in Washington D.C. in the states. They have the most most powerful thing that's out there. They can influence anybody. Lobbyists aren't supposed to, aren't. When's the last time you even saw a story? A story anywhere. And this is the internet age. Yeah. When's you saw a story of anybody that's fighting to get rights to go into Antarctica? It's it's unheard of. It's what what conspiracy is bigger than money? And this is it. It doesn't. This is beyond money. That money because this goes into a whole culture fragmentation potentially. Of, of think bad things that could happen. Look, if, if you there's even a, a two percent chance that the population would turn to pitchforks and torches and start going after people, you're not going to do it. You're not going to. The the board meeting on this decision to to keep this thing a secret probably lasted about ten minutes. And people's like, okay, what what could happen that was bad? It's like, what are you talking about? You mean like educationally, financially, spiritually? <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> the whole thing could come crumbling down around our ears in a matter of a month. It's like, yeah, okay, we're gonna drag this thing out as long as we can. And again, it's done really, really well up until very, very recently. And now, for whatever reason, either they're laying it out or we're discovering it. When we get towards the entrances or whatever way would be into the earth itself, do you mm -hmm. think that it's ice covered? Do you think that there's vegetation around it? You know, Google Earth has kind of blacked a lot of things out. What do you uh, think? Well, one, you can't trust Google Earth anyway or the, or the GPS system because it's all, it's all fabricated. So kind of like GPS system, people say, well, no, I use GPS to do stuff. It's like, look, GPS was designed by the United States Department of Defense back in the 90s. It's it's pure military. So they can not only, yeah, on small doses, yeah, they can tell you where to go to get your morning coffee. But they can also guide your plane around things. If they don't want you near something, they can correct the course in that plane in two seconds. Most, most planes pretty much fly themselves. But when it comes to the hiding, yeah, things like the the any entrances to they're well well hidden, and they've had six decades to do it in an almost an unlimited budget. Uh, the only thing that they have a limit on is technology to do it with, and so you might as well ask at that point what 
I, I'd answer it the same way I do when people say, what's the firmament or what's the dome made out of? So I take your pick. You know, if you're into science fiction, there's a half a dozen disciplines you could you could turn on. You know, is it a high frequency? Is it a um, electromagnetic field? Is it a heavy element? Is it a heavy water? Uh, whatever force field technology you want to come up with, take your take your pick. It's it's it could be used, but whatever it is, it's probably using some sort of stealth stealth material, so that even if you know random something or other came by it, they wouldn't notice it. You know, wouldn't be glaring. Well, wouldn't be re- wouldn't be red. Yeah, the, I've seen lots of claims that once inside, there's lakes or oceans or even suns, all yep. times of uh, all kinds of uh, you know other types of uh, uh, inhabitants, whether they're yep. human or reptilian or whatever. What have you come across? Yeah, the some of the stories. The um, look if you want to look at, look at you know I, uh, there's only so much we can cover in this program but if you want to look at some follow-up stories look at something two terms really easy to remember one's called the king of the earth and the other one's called the smoky god the smoky god is very very interesting about other older cultures that went by boat and supposedly got in there where you know they ran into you know the vegetation got bought, got more and more lush as they got to the north pole and then when they got in, it did literally turn into you know one of our many movies about the journey to the center of the earth, and where where there's older beings. And I've I've talked about this in different things for years, but I never decided to make any videos on it because it's like, well, you know, it's just my idea. But my idea was it was something I came up with called the Basement Club, which is any civilization. Once it reaches its apex, and we'll use a Terence McKenna term, once novelty has run out, you know, once once there's nothing new under the sun or on the surface, we'll we'll just flip those two, then that civilization has to make way for another civilization. Now, whether or not that civilization goes through a catastrophe or some sort of golden age, either way, you gotta get off the dance floor. Right? So what's the what's the saying that they say? You don't have to go home, but you gotta get out of here. And I think any surviving members of older versions, because I, I firmly, firmly believe at the very least that we are not the first civilization to rent this apartment. Anyone has any doubts in that, look at the sunken cities off of Japan or India or you know, look at the pyramids, how old they really are, or the Bosnian pyramids. There's so many out there. And once that civilization leaves they are again they're allowed limited contact with the surface but they have to go somewhere so where are you going to go again subterranean systems can be extremely comfortable and why not i mean what's the difference between a subterranean system and a system on the surface that's enclosed is there really any difference it's really i personally it's like you're choosing between one apartment and another and so I think that other civilizations absolutely are looking down there. The question is where, what were they, you know, the backstories are the most fascinating. What were they based off of? Where, you know, how long did they live? How did they end? You know, we're talking about the, the theory of Atlantis and the continent of Mu. You know, were they, you know, if we were based off of mammals, were there some that were based off of reptilian? Were there some that were based off in insects and, or aquatic? Take your pick, right? And could they coexist? Could it turn into a, you know, a, a Star Trek bar where there, you've got multiple different races? Or do they all kind of look similar, but it's the genetic code that really, that really tells the tale? Uh, yeah, it, it could go either way with that. And, but yeah, I, I firmly believe that, that anything you see flying around above us is the advanced technology that is being used by older versions of us. And I'll go one step further which is, you're thinking, oh, that's a stretch. Oh, no, it's not, not so much. Because think what would happen if there was an apocalypse that happened here, right, on our world, in you know, our civilization. And we'll just take one of the fallout, the, the heavy-duty fallout shelters, like, say, Cheyenne Mountain out in Colorado. Now, a bunch of military are going to go in there, seal the door up, and, hey, within a very short amount of time, civilization withers to nothing because, you know, with our food distribution system the way it is, you know, all you have to do is shut down the trucks and that's it. People, nobody farms anymore. People would run out of food in two seconds. So within a matter of a couple generations, the the civilization would turn into a survival civilization. It'd be this post-apocalyptic civilization. And think of the things that would be lost in those two generations. We're talking, you know, generations, what, 20, 25 years. So 50 years, Think of all the things that would be lost, like 
history. That's one of the first things you throw out the window. Uh, language would be altered. Uh, technology would be severely reduced. Who's going to teach anybody about tech? You know, once the batteries run out, what do you, what do you, you know, you're back to the 1800s, the mid 1800s, really. And you're, you're, a lot of it is lost. And then all of a sudden, let's say 50 years later, people in Cheyenne Mountain decided that they're going to let their helicopters out and start flying around. You're going to have kids or people, you know, that are, once you reach a certain age, they're going to have no idea what they're looking at. Never seen a helicopter before in their life. It might as well be gods. It might as well be angels or, they, or, the, or metal birds or whatever you want to take your, take your legend pick there. And uh, it's, it's fascinating how quickly w things can change in, in that regard. So, yeah, I, I, I think that everybody else out there is, is just us. It's just version – if we're version 7, who is version 6 and version 5? And, of course, the big question – you know, who was version one and if you're into the whole biblical thing yeah you probably got a few ideas on that yeah the you know i also think that potentially the oceans are other gateways into the earth uh i think that's that, that is uh, made obvious by the you know visual that people have seen how craft come out of the water they you know they're going somewhere or at least yeah. some kind of underground but uh you know there's tramways underneath us there's yep. underground bases underneath us there's even uh, sightings of s submarines emerging from lakes that border Nevada and California, yep. and then they go back down again. So there's something that connects the oceans in this massive uh, connection. So. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And you got to remember that the only thing, because a lot of people, in fact, I'm looking at one of my thumbnails right now. I was going to do it because if you're old enough, you remember the cartoon show called The Jetsons, which was the future version of the Flintstones. And everybody had flying cars. That was the big thing. You know, those cool little flying cars that never ran out of gas and, you know, great big huge windshields and, and they were perfect. It was like, wow, I can't wait to get one of those. We should have had flying cars by now. And really any UFO technology is based on this. It's based on the um, uh, the UF engine, the, the unified field engine, uh, which is based on the unified field, the the equation that has never been released that, that Einstein supposedly was working on. And I think he finished, but he wasn't going to let, let – uh, let us have it, which was the balance between electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. And, you know, if you had a power source that can manipulate these two frequencies, then you could have a craft that could basically fly at any speed and with with instant velocity with no G-forces, which was, you know, it's amazing. Plus, it's an all-in-one vehicle. You even try to introduce a vehicle like that into to our technology now well one you couldn't anyway because once you have that then you know where you are because the first thing you do is you just crank it and see how far it can go up and once you realize what the world really looks like well then the jig is up but the other thing is if you try to release a technology like that now the economy the world economy would just self implode because it's an all-in-one vehicle the 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 standard ufo model which we all know and love is a car it is a submarine it is a spaceship, it is an airplane. It replaces all these things. It's like the uh, like the iPad. You know, they call it the iPad like the everything killer or the uh, the smartphone, the everything killer. And it has. It's killed off a lot of smaller industries, but the um, the UFO engine would kill off all the major agencies. I mean, you, you're you're talking about simultaneously killing off rail, car, you know, airplane, uh, car, ship, and submarine, it, rendering all obsolete literally overnight. Uh, you know, no, 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 we couldn't survive that economically. There's too many industries tied to it, including, you know, the military. The military would have to rebuild from the ground up. Have you ever seen a connection with the Mariana Trench at all with uh, subterranean? No, not really. I mean, yeah, there's probably some, some entries down there to do different things. I mean, ocean entries would be quite convenient because, one, we had our deep sea bathyscap, bathyscaps, the deep sea vessels are very limited. And it's very slow moving. And the only people that can get down to any depths are the military, and they can keep a secret for the most part. You know, just if you you just not show things on, on certain radars. So at that point, you know, you just create some sort of an electromagnetic field, some entrance that, you know, doesn't allow the water through or, you know, treat it kind of like a toilet thing where pressure keeps it going. And that's it. You know, and you, you've got it. And then you don't have to worry about going into weird caves or flying too far north and too far south, you can just use the ocean. And since the ocean is everywhere, 
why not? And there's plenty of Navy personnel that have, have mentioned sightings over the years. Uh, you know, big giant craft that are coming in and out of the oceans. And maybe that's one of the keys when it comes to the oceans. Maybe the, the bigger craft have to use those because you uh, uh, otherwise you're getting too close to land and it would it would be too visible. Well, I know that um, Bush Jr., when he was in office, he made the Mariana Trench off limits to everyone. And hmm. it's only a selected few of the military that are allowed to go there. So sure. that, you know, there's got to be something something up with that. Well, Maybe. As, as, I mean, go ahead. The the movie The Abyss, one of James Cameron James Cameron's first from the late '80s, kind of touched on that. Where the in fact, you wonder where they got that because I think Bush was in was in Bush in office in 1988 89, where he or they the, there was this deep sea. Uh, the, the climax, the last hour of the movie was there was a giant spacecraft at the bottom of this very, very deep place of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And this private oil firm accidentally ran into it because there was a military conflict up top. And sure, why, why not? Again, if you have an electric, if you have a UF engine, pressure doesn't mean anything to you. It's uh, the, the field can hold anything. So water pressure. Now, granted, they move a lot slower underwater. They don't move 5000 miles an hour underwater. But at the same time, you're still moving very, very fast. I mean, I've still heard reports of, of several hundred, hundred miles an hour under the water, which is extremely fast. The fastest boats I think we have can't even break 200. And that's on the surface. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I understand that some of the torpedoes, the theory of they have a little air bubble on the front of the tip when it goes through the water, and they literally can go several hundred miles an hour. It somehow reduces the friction, so I think that it is possible. Now, Maybe. the the area you live, is there a lot of UFO sightings in that area? Uh, the Northwest isn't as much, but I think that's mostly because of visibility issues. Uh, where I'm from, where I spent the last 20 years, which was in Colorado, so Colorado has 300 sunny, 300 sunny days a year. So Colorado's great for that, because and it's clear, it's, you know, it's high altitude, 5,000 feet minimum, and for for most parts and so it's it's great visibility to see all sorts of stuff that's where i did some wonderful night vision sighting out here in the northwest though you know there's a place down south of seattle that gets 220 overcast days a year which is you know means you're not seeing anything really you're it's it's very very um very very limited to to what you can do here i mean i've i've gone on some clear nights and i have seen things sure but I have to wait for the clear nights, whereas in Colorado, you don't have to wait at all. I mean, most nights are clear. Yeah. It's it, Colorado is technically a high desert. It, we're, so. we're pretty much in the same area, so we've just been hammered by rain again and again and again. I've so, never seen rain like I have this year. Yeah, yeah. Ever. It, it has been, it been incredible. So you've got a website, and you've got lots of uh, videos for documentation. You want to tell mm -hmm. us about that? Sure. The website which I started based on my original video series, which I was start, it was just a thought experiment that went horribly wrong, and I put out there, it was called Flat Earth Clues. And I, the website I built because Coast to Coast had interviewed me almost immediately, which I thought was odd. And they were upset that I didn't have a website. So right, it's like, it's like, why would I have a website? I didn't even think this thing was going to catch on. So the website is called enclosedworld.com because not only do I believe that the world that we live on is flat, I believe that it is a giant enclosed system like a terrarium slash planetarium slash wildlife preserve slash Truman Show slash Hollywood backlot. You know, it's basically you're in a building is what I'm saying. And the building is so big that you can't even, you can't see the boundaries and, and we figured it out. The government figured it out in the 1950s and they decided not to tell anybody. The videos, all the videos, uh, if, if you go online, all you have to do, it, just go to YouTube, that's probably the easiest way, and type in, if you want to see my stuff, type in Flat Earth Clues, three words, Flat Earth Clues, or you can just type in Flat Earth and you can see everybody's, and there's a huge amount of content now. I'm just envious of anybody that gets into this concept now because the the wall of content you'll lose sleep for weeks but and i gotta warn the people that are that are listening if you try to get into it you know first off if if you're if you are happy with the life that you're living and you don't want to mess with it sort of the neo matrixy thing don't look at this don't do it but if you do 
I'm not going to be held responsible because you are going to lose a whole bunch of sleep because it completely messes with your your normalcy bias and you'll 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 think you've gone crazy for a while there. But once you come out the other end, it's a fun it's a fun ride. Yeah, well, that, it took a couple years for me to transition over. You know, yeah. I, I first looked at it and thought about it, and then finally it was just a day, you know, uh, it, it's got to be. And so that was why I had you on a couple months ago. Yeah. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have some contact information in case someone's got a question? Sure, sure you bet. You can, you can email me. I've only had one email in my life except for corporate emails, and that is M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T-23 at Comcast.net. And if you don't remember that, uh, that's fine because it's literally in the description page and of every video I make and it's on the end of pretty much every video I make. My phone number, if you want to call and leave phone messages, is 303-494-6631 or 720-897-6111 and those numbers are also out there. And again, everything goes to voicemail. I, I, I have to screen. I, I put my phone number in the, literally the first video I made and thinking, oh, well, you know, because I wanted to say, if anyone thinks they can prove Flat Earth wrong, go ahead and call me. And nobody called me to, to everyone just called me thanking me, and then the interviews and stuff started happening. So, yeah, that's a, the easiest way to get a hold of me is, is by email. Email is probably quicker because I, I can get through them faster. Phone messages, I appreciate all the phone messages. And if anyone wants to, do, you know, to talk to me about other things, just either way. Right. I uh, didn't get a chance. To, I've been very, very busy to get your stuff up on my side on Tinfoil Hat Club, but I will do that tonight, and oh, cool. I'll, I'll confirm all the information on the website. So as I, I close out here, is there something you want to finish out with? Uh, yeah. We, the this thing has gotten so big. Let me let me close with a, you know, what you could be missing type of thing. In case you've been hiding under a rock for the last well, better part of two years now, something's really been happening with our civilization, which is if you typed flat Earth into a search engine, even in the beginning of 2015, you would have gotten maybe 50,000 results. You type flat Earth in now, you sort by upload date, it, we're pushing about 17 million. That's a pretty big, pretty pretty big jump, and you're thinking, well, what's that compared to? Okay, type in Donald Trump, uh, you know, the most talked about president who going to be of all time before it's over. He's coming in at about 18 million, and we're doing that without any marketing dollars at all. And it's gotten so big that heck, there's a conference, the Flat Earth International Conference. There's what there's a tour, a Flat Earth International tour that's happening in Europe already. And the Americans are going to do a Flat Earth International Conference here in the fall in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we've already you know, got the guest speakers set up and it's, it's selling tickets and it's going to be a great thing. If anyone wants to check it out, go to FE, otherwise known as Flat Earth, so FE2017.com. Yeah, I know when Obama was in office, he even uh, made uh, comments on that. Yeah. So... All right. Well, you were also saying something about uh, basketball or something. Is that? You... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When when you go to and this happened actually shortly after the last interview I did with you, shortly after that happened. Well, first off, there was a guy that went into the hills in Los Angeles, in an orange jumpsuit and a and a hard hat and car and carved in a hillside and giant. 10 foot letters or whatever it was Google flat earth which was interesting I thought that would have been a good enough story for the week but a couple days after that the NBA current reigning champion NBA point guard Kyrie Irving came out during a podcast and and he's known for being into conspiracies and graduated from Duke and said that he was a flat earther and he said yeah NASA's full of full of crap and and I'm totally on board and he did this just before the all-star game so when he landed, all these reporters were waiting for him because the All-Star is all about the media. And then his teammate LeBron James comes in and starts – doesn't condemn him for it. Draymond Green starts talking about it. And then immediately all the sports stations – ESPN just ran you know, every show they had. Time was only, you know, 120 sports, first take, the jump, Sports Nation. They all started talking about it. And just when I thought I was going to settle down a little bit – uh, and of course, you know, they, they drug Neil deGrasse Tyson and it was on Bill Maher and I'm listening to Mike and Mike. Just when it started to settle down a little bit, then Shaquille O'Neal 
the living legend Hall of Fame NBA, he came out during one of his podcasts and said he was into Flat Earth. And that generated a huge amount of controversy. Now, did he come backpedal five days later? Yes, he did. And he did it on national television. It looked very scripted, but it didn't really matter. It took him five days to backpedal. It's not like he was did a media blackout. It took him that long before his agent finally convinced him. It's like, look, Shaq, you make $20 million a year in endorsements. You don't even play anymore. So you might not want to mess with that. And you know, it's letting, he's right. A lot of money is involved there. And so Shaq backpedaled a little bit. But the, the mainstream media exposure was massive. And that was you know just a couple months ago. Not even a couple months. It was and it was huge what happened. And so we've been riding this wave now, this big push. And the timing couldn't have been better because that's when we all of a sudden we started pushing the conference and uh, a lot of the expo so many more millions and millions and millions of people. I mean, heck, Kyrie Irving alone has millions of Twitter followers. Just just him, let alone the other the other guys that are out there. So and it's and it's out there permanently. So if you type in flat earth into just just into Google, you'll run into a lot of celebrities recently, which is mostly athletic, which is an interesting, interesting thing. But it made sense because especially with basketball, they're on the road a lot, which means they watch a lot of media and can't wait to see if anybody because baseball season is just starting up. Hope a few baseball players jump in on this. <laughs> well, Mark, I want to thank you for being on tonight. It, it's been a couple of months. And when we did the Flat Earth, in fact, if you go back to the archives, that you'll find that, and I think that you also made a video of that show too, or that's what you've been doing, and you'll probably do one of this as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I take the interview and then I put it to, I put a bunch of flattered slides behind it. I don't sync it up with anything because it just takes too long. Sure. And then I put it up on YouTube on my on my YouTube channel, so you'll be able to find it. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's called Mark K. Sargent. But again, it's not as easy as to remember. It's just typing in flat earth clues, and eventually you'll get to me. Right. Okay, well then, when you you have something, you know, your new projects or whatever you're doing, we'll have you back. Does that sound pretty good? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. Thank you.